Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Jim Gaskins wrote his book, Stone Effigies of the High Plains Hunters, to shed light on what he calls a secret world of art. He'll show us examples of effigies he has collected, including bears, birds, buffaloes, bobcats, and more. Wyoming author Jim Gaskins and his stone effigies on the next Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. And we welcome our viewers to this surprising Wyoming Chronicle on Stone Effigies with Jim Gaskins, the author of the book we're going to talk about today. Jim, you wrote the book Stone Effigies of the High Plains Hunters almost 20 years ago. And before we get into what I think is awfully surprising um, examples of work that you brought to, to show our viewers today, I want to talk about you and your history just a little bit. Where did you grow up? Oh, I was born in Peoria, Illinois, but my, we didn't live there very long. Mom and Dad, Dad worked in the Caterpillar plant, and we moved to Missouri shortly after that. And uh, I was raised down in the deep woods of Missouri back there. Uh, my grandparents were very poor people. You write in your book that your grandma, Pearl, uh -huh. was very influential in kind of getting you started yes. as a very young child of having an interest in, in, um, in arrowheads and later effigies. Yeah, and she had, well, she didn't know about the effigies. Okay. She, she had a pretty fine arrowhead collection and a lot of them my dad found and grandpa axe heads and stuff like that back there in Missouri. But she didn't know nothing about the effigy. We just thought they weren't just Leverite, you know. They weren't enough worth picking up if it wasn't an arrowhead. So that came a little bit later. When, when did you start learning about effigies? And let's tell our viewers, what is an effigy? An effigy is a, a stone that the ancient man is, was, is highly revered them. Uh, they're a spiritual stone, uh, and they were left usually at sh as shaman structures and stuff. But I found them in many different places other than shaman structures. Shaman or shaman is another shaman, way that, same that, thing, that uh -huh. that's produced, okay. It's where the medicine uh, man used to go pray and stuff. Uh -huh. And they'd leave these to pay homage to the animals so that they would uh, make their self available for them in the hunts so they could be hunted again. And they also left things that they feared, like the conquistadors. They'd leave stuff like that to uh, keep ward them off. Okay. When did you come to Wyoming, and what brought you here? Uh, I graduated in 1971 in the coal mines. And my dad was a coal miner, and uh, I worked on a ranch over in Nebraska for a little while, a couple of ranches over there when I first got out of school. And then they started up the Arch Manor coal mines over here, and I uh, come over there and went to work. You're a welder by trade. Yeah, I've been welding over 45 years. Do you still weld today? Oh, yeah, yeah. I have some friends that have got me doing jobs and stuff, but I've been retired for two and a half years now. So you started collecting effigies. Why? What brought you to, to that point, and, and how did you begin to learn about effigies? Well, once I found that first <coughs> one uh, and realized how the Indians were really looking at these stones, they got me looking at them closer. And then I found another one. It was a wolf's head. And uh, th then I kept seeing more and more and more. And then the more I saw, the more I understood how, what there was. You Have know. you counted your collection? How many different effigies do you think you, you've discovered? Oh, at least 200 or uh -huh. more. And I should tell our viewers that, that you have written this book, and there may be another book in your future. Is that well, correct? I plan on to write another book. Yeah. In fact, some of the, the effigies that we'll look at a little bit later here aren't in the first one, they might make the... Yeah, they're going to be in the second in the one. the second uh -huh. edition. Jim, I want to visit with you just a little bit. Archaeologists kind of disagree with the yeah. relevance of effigies. You call it a secret art that is mm -hmm. largely undiscovered. And so 
give us some more information about why you think this is so relevant. Well, I went to the University of uh, Wyoming down here and talked to George Frizen. He was their head archaeologist at that time, very well-renowned man, uh, did the war sites and stuff up in Wyoming, and many digs here in Wyoming, very smart man. And I took him to him and showed him to him. And he said, yeah, we recognize them, but he said, we don't know how they made them. He said, we cannot figure out how they fractured these things to, so complex that there's, there's, there's no way to figure them out. I mean, some of them are like the, they were clay and they were formed, but this is out of agate and stone. And uh, that's what he told me. Mm -hmm. But he said that they're uh, not considered artifacts because they couldn't uh, figure out how they were made. And what does that mean, that it's not an artifact? Does that mean? That means you can pick them up anywhere you want. You know, if it's a federal, state land, wherever, you know, it's no different than somebody going out and hunting jade or agates and stuff like that. And certainly if, if you're going on private land, you would yeah, very much encourage folks to get the proper permissions and well, to sure, do their research. Yeah, and don't ever disturb any of the uh, shaman sites, you know, the main structures and stuff. Don't ever move those stones. Jim, this is one of my favorites. It's, it's a Thunderbird. Yeah. What are we looking at? This is a Knife River Flint. And it has come out of the Glendale area down there by Big Glendale. And you can see the two tips of the wings of the Thunderbird, and this is the tip of his beak, and right here there's a little notch that uh, separates it. It's not a broken arrowhead. It looks like an arrowhead, but it's not. It's a ceremonial piece. Someone likely carried that with them for a, for yeah, a particular it, reason. It's, it's a ceremonial piece, yeah. And they may have been, actually the place it was found, uh, it wasn't, wasn't really an Indian camp. And you were telling me that maybe just a quarter inch of this stone was, was sticking out of the ground yeah, when just, you saw it? just barely a quarter of an inch of it, the edge of one of this edge here, I think it was, was barely sticking out of the ground. What else do you have here, Jim? Let's go to another stone. Okay. This is an American lion. This stone, uh, they lived here 25,000 years ago. Uh, you can see his nose and his mouth, he's, and then he's got an eye right there, and all the rough part is his mane. It's very smooth and very weathered, very it old stone. It looks polished almost. Yeah, it is. I mean, the, the weather polished it. Uh -huh. After th tens of thousands of years being on that ledge, you know, the, and there's no telling when man made this. Where did you find that? Uh, that place called the Spanish Diggings, and it's out uh, west of Douglas here, down by Shawnee. And there's a road there that says Spanish Diggings. You go back there, and there's pits dug in the ground, and uh, they thought the Spanish was in there digging for gold. But that's not what they were doing. It was the Indians digging down in the ground for flint, because the, the flint that's in the ground still has moisture in it. And when they flake the arrowheads, the, the, it's like it's, it's more elastic and they can carry a flake farther across okay. than the piece that they found out on the surface. Let's go to another um, effigy, Jim, that's here. Okay, it, 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 this is an old turtle head. <clears throat> and this stone, there's a stone in the back of it and, and most of it was covered up in the dirt, but uh, my wife found this one, and uh, it was buried probably here, all the nose, all this was covered with dirt. And then uh, she saw the stone in the back of the rock. If I may, you can see the eye on one side uh -huh. and the eye on the other side. Yeah, and it's got like a mouth down across the bottom there, and it's a turtle's head is what it is. And there's a stone that was in the back of the rock when we found it. And what, what do you think that means? And, what do you, and hollowed that out. That's sandstone, I believe. Uh -huh. And why do you think they hollowed that out? To give them a place to put the stone. Okay. Just a, just a handy spot to have the stone, you know. Do you think it was art, ceremonial, something of ceremonial value? or? or uh, it could have been. It could have been. Uh -huh. Because, like I said, uh, uh, 
they were very religious about stuff like this. And the turtles were highly revered. For, uh, they thought they had great wisdom and stuff. And uh, they were highly revered. Tell us about the mice, Jim. With, um... Okay, well, you can see it, it, there's a little white mouse. The little stone has been busted in half. And the geologic makeup of this, there's a little white mouse here. You can see his mouth and his nose. He's got a little eye, and this is his body back here. And it looks like a picture that's on the stone. Well, I found this 20 years ago. There's some shameless structures behind my house. And we went up a couple of months ago to uh, look for some effigies and just get out of the house, you know. And I seen this stone sitting on the ground just like that, and I seen where it had been, it had been chipped on. And so I picked it up and turned it over, and there is the other half of the white mouse. And this is the exact stone they chipped it off of. And in fact, if you put it back together... Yeah, you put it back together... There, there it is. I mean, it's right there. 20 years later. 20 years later. I mean, what's the odds of going back and finding the other half? Somewhat slim. Yep. <laughs> Pretty lucky. Yeah. But that's a... And, you, and they had a lot of... Uh, uh, like I said, uh, I've got puppy dogs, boys' faces, uh, birds. Uh, I've got one stone that's got a bird on it, and you turn, roll it around on the bottom side, and it's got a mouse. Yep. Take a look at the wolf, maybe. Oh, yeah. 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 This is a very good one. This is the three-dimensional. This wolf is three-dimensional. Here's his two ears. He's got a little black eye, and this is his nose. He's got a little mouth down here. And it's a white stone. It may have been a, an albino wolf. You know, uh, the colors of the stone meant a lot to them. This gym is maybe your favorite? Yeah, that's, now, th that's the most complicated uh, chipping one I've ever seen. Jim, I'm going to have you reach down and, and grab your um, flashlight <coughs> to your left. I'm going to see if that will help our viewers. Um, I'll hold that while you maybe explain it. How okay. does that sound? Then point it straight down, kind of like this. This is the deer's head. The nose, and this little white dot is the deer's ear. This is his jawbone. This is his neck, and this is the front leg of the deer. This is his belly back here. This is the nose of the bear, his muzzle, and this is his eyebrow, and his ear comes back like this, it's translucent. And all of this here, this uh, rough rock, is imitating fur. And you can see how it comes around here, and it's got a little hook coming down on it like that. The, and right on the very end of it is a translucent claw. I don't know if you can see that or not. I may mean, need to tilt it that way a little it, better. I, I hope our viewers can see this because I can. And it, to me, is exactly as you're describing it, Jim. And I, this hole back here is right in the heart-lung shot area that would kill that bear. And this stone's telling you a story. They killed that bear when it was on that deer. He was eating that deer when they killed him. Can you see it? I sure can. It's almost eerie. Um, I, I, it's just how, a, how would you chip, how would they chip that? I, I, I certainly don't know, That's but what it's I mean, um, it's uh, and it, and the other thing I wonder about is how long did it take them? Um, did, did this take months or years? Yeah, I mean, is this how something did they control that it? even the little jawline right here of the. That what amazes me is how they crit that little jaw line there for the jaw of the deer. Yep. I mean, that's, that's to control that. I'm going to turn our light off now, yep. and we, we've got a couple more here to show, I think. Okay. This is a mountain man wearing a bearskin hat. This is the beard of the mountain man. Here's his nose, and you can see where they chip I can see it right up here. You can see his eye chipped out here, his nose. And this is his beard and his mouth down in there. And the bear, this is the nose of the bear up here. And this, the skin comes down around this. this. This is the ear of the bear. But it's a, it's a mountain man wearing a bearskin hat.
Jim, you brought one more over. Um, what are we looking at? This is a shaman. He's got a bobcat skin headdress on. So this is the back of the bobcat? Yeah, this is the ears, the uh -huh. ears of the, the bobcat. Two ears. Uh -huh. And his nose, and this is his body coming down here. This is his butt, and he's got a little tail. And this is a shaman. The shaman's right here. He's got an upper, a lower lip, upper lip, his nose, and his eye. And it looks like he's got an old wrinkled face. It sure does. It looks like an old man, you know. Is this the eyebrow? Is yeah, that what that, that is? That's the eyebrow up there. And the, 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 here's the back leg of the bobcat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is the front leg coming up. And this is his body, his belly. This is his back and his tail down here on the bottom. Other, some people pronounce it shaman, correct? And yeah, you pronounce shaman, it, you, uh -huh. you pronounce it shaman. Yeah. Uh-huh. The shaman is, is, is whatever you people like to call it, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's what that is. He's is an old shaman. That's got Which a, is a, a, a medicine man? Is that yeah, what a shaman yep, is? Yep. Spiritual? Yep. He's a, mm -hmm. a holy, the holy man of the... Mm -hmm tribe, you know, that's who they went to for medicine, and he knew all about the medicine and stuff like that. Jim, this is a rhinoceros? This is a rhinoceros. 25,000 years ago, the woolly rhino lived here with the woolly mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers, uh, camels, uh, the American lions, they all roamed here at the same time. And this is, he's even got little lips on him. Got little lips. This is the tip of his horn, tip of his ear. But this here's got other effigies on it too. Looking this way, it's a bobcat. This is the nose and the ear of the bobcat. If you turn it up this way, it's a bear. Here's the nose of the bear and his ear up here. And if you turn it all the way completely upside down, it's a buffalo. These are the <laughs> legs of the buffalo. And then there's, you can you see the little curl of horn right here, and that's the buffalo's body. And this is his nose over here. Jim, there's a lot of interpretation here. Oh yeah, I mean there is, you know. Uh, and they love to make, and this could have been some type of bird too. The, the way this. I actually beak see that. Is, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> that could have been some some type of bird, but they love to make effigies that had different kinds of animals on them. See this one here, you can see it's like it's got the bobcat, like it's got a mouth there. It's oh, smile. I, I absolutely see the mouth. Yeah, and, and right here you can see a mouth on him, see? But you can see where they chipped his eye. You've got a place there where they chipped his eye. I'm not a geologist, but it, it, it doesn't look natural, and I can see where that may have been, may have been chipped. Oh yeah, it's been chipped, you yeah, have no doubt about it. And it's very old, I mean, this is, the, like I say, the rhinos lived here so long ago. Uh, this had to have been made by a prehistoric man. So you have a kind of a small part of your collection here. Yeah. That, um, and we're in, by the way, the beautiful Converse County Library here in Douglas. We're yeah, very, it's very a beautiful place. Thankful that they're allowing us to, to shoot here today. How much time do you have invested? Do you think in collecting effigies over the years? It must be uh -oh. hundreds, if not thousands, of hours. Oh yeah, forty years. Uh huh. Just collecting effigies and stuff. Is there a place or a couple places in Wyoming that have been very important to you in, in this kind of journey that you're on? Um, I'll tell you, any place ancient man and the Indians lived and stuff like that, you're, you're going to find them. You're going to find them. And I believe they're all over the world. I have seen pictures from Australia, <clears throat> Europe, uh, South America, and Mexico. Uh, st stones that they had, I could see the effigies in the pic in the photograph. So I, I'd say every place that man was there, and this is probably some of the first forms of religion that there ever was. You you must have a keen eye for for spotting these. Well, as soon as as soon as you understand it, and and yeah, you, it it took me about two years to get my family. They, they thought I was crazy, but <laughs> then whenever they started seeing them. Then they picked right up on it just like that, and they found some of the best ones. Do you have in, in your mind, maybe if archaeologists haven't spent enough time maybe trying to understand this, how some of these might have been created? Well, that's, that's, a, that's what I was trying to get uh, the university to do a study on this. And they're in their dig sites 
there's they can age it. They, they can tell what the dates were, carbon dating, you know, of uh, bones and stuff at certain levels. And they find these effigies in those dig sites. And that would, then it would be, you could be able to age them and tell them more of what they saw at that time, you know, and how old they are, where these are all surface finds. Do you have any idea <clears throat> on the age of some of your effigies, how old they might be? Well, like I said, some of these, this rhinoceros right here, they roamed this land 25,000 years ago. Woolly rhinos, camels, uh, saber-toothed tigers, mammoths, and all that. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, there's no telling what the age of this stone is. This is probably not a complete list. I might have missed some. You have effigies of beaver, eagles, badgers, grouse, birds, bobcats, buffaloes, owls, rabbits, sea lions, seals, dogs, donkeys, ferrets, wolves, fox, coyotes, mice, <laughs> a man on the moon, snakes, yeah. and of, of humans. Yeah. Man, there's celestial bodies. They, man in the moon was a big thing for them, you know. Uh, they was always looking at the stars and stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, all that stuff. I mean, they made so many different types of animals. I even have a giraffe <coughs> over that's, here yep. that's going to be in the next book. Have you, um, have you ever looked at an effigy and changed your thought over time on what this effigy might have, might be or, or might represent or is it always that hey this is what it is and that sticks with you over time no I, like, like I say you try and figure out uh, each one what they were thinking when they made it I've got one over here that's a grizzly bear and it's got a deer in his mouth and he the deer he was killing that deer but then the, the grizzly hole's got a hole right here in a heart lung shot area and it's it, they killed it it's telling a story they killed that bear when it was eating that deer do you have any idea how long it might have taken ancient man to make some of these effigies oh i don't, I don't know and some of the fractures like i can chip an arrowhead you know but the fractures they make is uh, unbelievable just like on the bighorn sheep and i mean the, the, there's no explaining it if it just lays on the ground and nobody ever knows about it and stuff, uh, I feel a part of our history being lost. And uh, it, it, nobody's going to benefit from it. Are you still active today? Do you still go out and, and Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. You? Like I say, it was just a couple of months ago I went up and found this rock here after 20 years. And, uh, no, I still love to go out. I ain't a spring chicken like I used to be, but uh, I still love to go out and hunt them. If you could reduce down to your couple, maybe favorite places in Wyoming, where would you like to go? Well, I tell you, all, all the whole Douglas area here, and actually the whole state of Wyoming, these things are everywhere. Well, your, your first book was Stone Effigies of the High Plains Hunters, Jim, and uh -huh. people can find that on, on Amazon, I believe, and other places too? Yeah, it's on Barnes & Noble, <clears throat> on Amazon, and you can get it on eBooks on uh, Google Play and Apple iPod, I think it is. You know, I got both versions. I got an ebook version and the, the, the book version. I, and I should encourage readers, for me, mm -hmm. the book version is just a lot better because your photography comes through better. Oh, yeah. Your drawings come through better. And I, and I very much enjoyed getting information from the real book uh -huh. um, vers versus the, the part that I read on, on, on my Kindle e-reader. Jim, as you travel around, are there other people across the country that have this same enthusiasm that you do about stone effigies? Yeah, there's a matter of fact, when I did a book signing over there in Casper, a uh, young man came up and told me his mother and father had a real nice collection of effigies. Uh huh. But they hadn't written a book or anything about it, it was just their own private collection. Sure. And uh, yeah, well, the people, I went back to my class reunion and showed him the book and uh, like I said, my old girlfriend brought up a stone to me and it was a perfect bobcat, just a beautiful one. And uh, that would come out of Missouri there. Sure. But the, any place there was Indians, uh, West Coast, East Coast, all over this country, uh, they're there. I mean, in ceremonial spots. Mm -hmm. And I've found them out in the rough playing golf. You know, you never know where you're going to find one. 
What's your timeline for maybe a next book? Have you thought about that in your mind? Oh, it'd probably be, I'd say a couple of years. I mean, it takes time to do the photography and, uh, and doing the artwork and stuff like that. And then you would want to have to do the research on why they made them. And, and uh, there's so much more information out there that I don't have in this book. But uh, I'd like to, in a couple of years, have another one out. Well, best wishes to you, Jim. The, um, I've learned a lot from, oh, from yeah. reading your book and, and seeing these um, in, in person also adds a dimension for, for me. And I, I think it's fascinating. Um, I'm a little bit surprised there aren't many, many, many others across the country who, who share this interest, but perhaps that'll happen. Well, I think, well I think this will open up a whole new field. And... Uh, archaeology and stuff and and put people more interested in uh, getting out there and trying to find these because I like hunting arrowheads but I tell you I like hunting effigies more. I think that you were right earlier when you talk about the stories that your mind goes to when you when mm -hmm. you see some of these and what may have been the thoughts of someone that's what you try to think thousands of, of years ago is is where I, I got found myself getting lost uh -huh. in a very good way you when you wonder why they made them and stuff uh, I've got one it's got two Indians side by side one of them's got a grouse headdress on and the other one's got a, a badger uh, headdress on I'll challenge our viewers to make sure that they can see the same things that you do but I think that um I think if they take a look at your book they might be surprised. It, oh, Jim, yeah. It's been a pleasure visiting with you, and I can't thank you enough for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Well, I appreciate you having me, and uh, and hope that everybody will get out there and have fun doing this and teach their kids and their grandkids so it can be carried on for generations and not lost. So. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.